Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require signs, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. We will pick right up and get right into another study from the book of Haggai. Again, from the book of Haggai, I've really enjoyed studying this book. I hope you have as well. I hope you have found it helpful and beneficial and something that has encouraged you and challenged you. And and Lord willing, I, I you know ultimately, I hope any study from the Word of God will help to um, strengthen your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate purpose of all of this, is that Christ be honored and glorified, that His His Word be proclaimed and sent out into the world in, in, in another format, you know, by way of these videos and audio. And ultimately, I hope it is a blessing and a help to you and anyone who listens with you. Thank you for taking the time to check in. Now, Haggai was faithful to confront Judah with God's word. Faithfulness of this sort is greatly lacking today in both the Christian and secular worlds. We have been forced into self-censorship by way of conformity to the doctrines of tolerance and political correctness. Haggai did not allow the ideological attitudes of his day to sway him. He was faithful to present God's word, though it was contrary to the people's daily lives. That's an, that's that's an area that we need to work on in the West, in America, anywhere that you are. But there, there are some places where this is more dominant than others. And in the West, Christians have sold out. Not all, but if we're talking about Christianity, large scale, big picture, <laughs> we're in trouble. Uh, so that, that needs to change. Furthermore, it was a most uncomfortable message to preach, but he was faithful and obedient to the Lord. Our responsibility today resembles this same order. We're, we're in no different of a position. We are to stand before the people and deliver God's word. Whether in Christendom or the secular world, it matters not. We are to preach the word instant, in season and out of season. Men may not like what is said, but this provides them opportunity to be confronted by the word of God. This confrontation is essential to the salvation of souls as well as the propagation of righteousness in the world. It doesn't happen otherwise. People aren't going to accidentally get saved. And righteousness is not going to be accidentally chosen. (laughs) Um, People have a tendency to turn away from that which is right and that which is good. For the most part, you know, if you ask people in the world, they're going to try, they're going to do their best to explain to you that people are mostly good. Well, compared to other people, they are mostly good. But compared to God's standard as set in his word, they're not mostly good at all. They're opportunistic. If if the opportunity in front of them uh, will will allow them to gain in some way, (laughs) they're going to choose unrighteousness. If, If that's what it will take in order to make that gain. How many times have we heard recently of women boasting about having an abortion? And, and that abortion allowing them, abortion allowed them to get ahead in life. That's disgusting. That's horrendous. And that's the world that we're, that we're living in. So people are not mostly good. They're mostly good compared to their neighbors. They're mostly good compared to 
the men that fill up our prisons, they're mostly good compared to our politicians, <laughs> but they're not mostly good when it comes to being compared with God's word. That's the standard. And if we don't go by that standard, we, we, we put ourselves in a position to be misled and misunderstood. So this confrontation is essential to the salvation of souls, as well as the propagation of righteousness in the world. When those who have the righteousness of Jesus Christ do not confront the world with his word, we facilitate the direction of a nation that has no fear of God. In turn, God will at some point be forced to intervene by way of judgment. You do not want God to intervene. <laughs> so humble thyself under the, under the mighty hand of God before he comes and does it for you. That would be the best route to take. Now, otherwise, when God's people are faithful to preach his word and people are obedient to, do, to, to that preaching, God is pleased and joins himself to such a people or nation. The options are clear. Receive God's blessing through our obedience to his word or receive God's judgment through our disobedience to his word. I know that's deep. <laughs> I, I get it. But... It's unbelievably relevant. And if we would keep it that simple, it would make life much easier. Now, as our starting point, we're going to look at Haggai chapter 1. And we'll start in verse 12. And, and I want to remind you of what's happening here and what's going on here. And then we're going to, we're going to launch off from there and, and compare Judah and Israel's attitude at other times towards their attitude to the preaching of God's word here in, in, in Haggai compared to that. So Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. They obeyed the voice of the Lord. Now in the book of Haggai, the people obeyed God's word. But this was not always the case. In fact, Judah, Israel, the nation of Israel as a whole, the two kingdoms, all of them collectively and, uh, and after their division and, and going their two separate ways with the, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, God sent prophets to both. And they either mocked them, killed them, rebelled against them, rebelled, rebelled against what they preached, uh, they wanted nothing to do with God and what God had to say. They, they, were, they were set in the way that they were living. They had no concern for God's confrontation of the way they were living. And they, they were determined to press on and do what they wanted. And they did. They absolutely did. And so we don't want to be that way. So I want to compare. We're going to take a moment. We're going to compare. Uh, first, we're going to look at Judah's attitude in Malachi. Now, now look at it again in Haggai. You know, let's, let's read it again so you can see this. Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. So God gave Haggai a message sent Haggai to preach that message to the people, and the people received it. They repented, and they began to build, they, they began again to rebuild the temple of God. And so this, this attitude of repentance was an anomaly in Judah's history, in Israel's history. It was not common. Now, you know, we, we know of a couple of revivals or, or uh, whatever you want to call it, great awakenings or this, this turn, this, this uh, large-scale repentance that takes place. It only happened a couple of times in the Bible. Usually it didn't go well for the prophet. It didn't go well for the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he came unto his own. 
and his own received them not and, and swore they would not have this man to reign over them and uh, ended up crying out to crucify him. Now, in, in our Bible, Zephaniah was the last prophet to prophesy before Judah went into Babylonian captivity. Haggai is the first prophet to prophesy after 70 years of captivity in, in Babylon. The king of Persia, King Cyrus, takes over and sends Judah back to Jerusalem. And so they begin rebuilding the temple. Then they go right back into apostasy and, and reject God and what he said and began making excuses for why it was okay that they were rejecting God and what God said. And uh, so God shows up and he deals with it. He sends Haggai with a deeply personal message that uh, just struck to the heart of people. How, how would you feel if God sent a prophet to knock on your door and say, how much money you spent on your house this month? Well, how much did you spend on God? You want to compare the two? You want to, uh, would you like God to come and lay out for you what it is that you have ascribed more importance to some area of your life, some material in your life, some person in your life, more so than, than, than to God himself? Man, that, that'd be a hard message to receive from God. But that's what he did to Judah in, in Haggai's day. He sent Judah and he said, you're not building my house, but you don't have a problem building your own house. You've shown complete disregard from my house, but you have no problem at all building your own house, taking care of your own house. There's an inordinate affection here, and God showed up and dealt with it and dealt with it harshly. Now, in Malachi's day, we're just going to look at a few of these because these few verses just give you the tone of the entire book of Malachi. This is the same people. So Haggai is the first prophet to prophesy after the return. Zechariah begins prophesying just a couple of months after Haggai, and then he prophes- he continues on after Haggai uh, finishes. Haggai preaches for about, about four months, it looks like, and uh, Zechariah just continues on. And then, then there's silence for some time, and uh, after that period of silence, you know, God is not immediately speaking to the nation of Israel, and and uh, during that period and during that time, um, uh, Malachi shows up and he begins preaching. And Judah is in horrendous condition at this point in time. God shows up and he doesn't have anything good to say. I mean, the whole nation is just in total corruption again. And God begins to deal with it and he begins to point this out and they, and they argue with God. So in Haggai's day, he shows up and he puts his finger in their chest and he gives them a deeply personal message. And they say, you're right, Lord, we repent, forgive us. We're going to get back to work. And they got right back to work and they got back into to, to build in the house of God and they finished that work and God helped them and it pleased God. And all these wonderful things happen as a result of their, their, their willingness to repent and obey God's word. Even when it was difficult. The circumstances were, were difficult. The preaching was difficult. The task was complicated and difficult. I mean, nothing about it was easy. But they did it and they got it done. Now look at Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2. It'd be good for us to read this and think about these words and just ask yourself, when somebody's preaching, do I argue with God like this? When somebody points out some aspect of my life that, that is out of line, and they show it to me in accord with God's word. Do I, do I get angry and get mad or, or, do I, uh, or do I do something about it? Do I argue with God and tell God he's wrong or do I do something about it? So Malachi chapter 1 verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. <laughs> so the Lord said, I have loved you. The Lord's trying to explain to them, explain to them his love for them and his concern for them. And they're like, when did you love us? You haven't loved us. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's why it's just wild to me. God, God shows up. I mean, it's the God of heaven and earth, the creator of heaven and earth shows up and says, I, you know, I got a problem to talk to you about. What problem? You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so Judah argued that God did not love them. And today, people do the exact opposite. The argument's slightly different today. Man's contention today is that God is love. Therefore, he would never punish me for my sin. So either way, man has developed this propensity to argue with God. 
to debate with God and, and try and set God straight. Hey, Lord, you're making a mistake. Um, Judah said, you don't love us. And God shows up in our world today and says, you keep doing that. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to judge you. Oh, God doesn't judge. Judge not lest you be judged. <laughs> you know, God is love. He just loves us. He's, he's happy with everything we do. There's a, I don't know if it's still there. It's been a long time since I've been in Orlando, but uh, our home church is in Deland, Florida, just north of Orlando. And we're here in Uganda, Africa now, but, um, there was a billboard that said, God sees you and he loves what he sees. <laughs> there was another one that said, uh, God is not angry. And so members of our church being the, the loving people they tend to be called that church and asked them about the passage when God said he is angry with the wicked every single day. And they had no answer. They had no response. You, you know, can you imagine telling a pedophile, God sees you? and he loves what he sees. What about a rapist or a murderer? And so man today wants to, they argue with God in the opposite direction. Judah told, God told Judah, I, I have loved you. And, and, and there's no telling what God intended to say after that. But no, they, they step right in. Excuse me. <laughs> when have you loved us? You haven't loved us. Today, man steps in. God says, you keep doing that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, I'm going to have to deal with it. Lord, just your love. You don't know. Don't talk to me about this judgment stuff. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just love. You're happy with everything I do. I mean, it's me. Did you forget who you were talking to? Don't you remember how wonderful I am and how excited you are to have me in your life? It's a ridiculous notion and attitude. You're going to step in and argue with, with the all wise God and, and correct him and straighten him out. It's not a good idea. I, I would discourage that mentality and attitude. I, I would encourage you to drop that. But right off the bat, verse 2, they're arguing with God. I mean, the book just opened, the book just got started, and they're already, they're already arguing with God. Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honoreth his father, and a master, and a servant his master, if then I be father, where is mine honor? And if I be master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised your name? Wherein have we despised thy name? We haven't despised your name. What are you talking about? God shows up and he says, if a father deserves honor, if a servant is to honor his master, and I am both a father and a master, <laughs> where's my honor? And he's speaking to the priests. A, a priesthood who at this point despised the name of, of God himself. And their response? What have we despised you? What are you talking about? God's lost his mind. God doesn't know what he's talking about. He's making these accusations, these baseless accusations against us. Uh, you know, somebody used to go straighten God out. That is man's mentality today. God accuses the priests of despising his name, and rather than repenting, they argue with God. God sends someone today and say, to say, have you seen what God's word says? Is that, I don't care what that book says. I'll tell you what God says. <laughs> we are made priests. That's us. You're born again. You're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're part of the body of Christ. Okay. We are made priests. And the moment we are made priests, the moment that Jesus Christ washed us in his blood. And when you hear preaching from God's word or correction from God's word, do you in turn argue with God? Do you try and straighten God out and, 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 and let him know the little mistake he made and, and directing that at you. It's, it, is, this is, it is a ridiculous notion, a ridiculous idea that you're going to straighten out God. You're going to argue with God. People read the Bible, and it'll say something, and they, they will, it, it'll be as plain as can be. And in response, they'll say, well, I just don't think God would do that. It says in his word, that's what he would do. That's who he is. That's how he operates. That's why he did it. That's where he came from. Whatever the case may be. Well, I just, you know, that's not what that means. 
Either it means what the words say or it means nothing at all. If, if you're going to pick and choose what each, each phrase means, well, well then there's an, there's an endless number of private interpretations that come along with that. And nobody gets anywhere in that case. That, that, that is not helpful to anyone in any way and should not happen. So if your intention is to justify your actions, if that's your aim, if that's your goal is, is to justify what it is you're doing, then just say that. Just say, I have decided I want to live this way. I want to do this. And so despite what God said in his word, I'm going to do contrary to that either way. Just say that. Just be upfront about it. Don't go around pretending that what you're doing is acceptable with God because it's not. I mean, we're six verses in to Malachi chapter one. <laughs> And the people are arguing with God. The priest is arguing with God. They're, they're just, anything God says, they, they, they immediately snap back. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Whew. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. That, that'll open a can of beans that, um, <laughs> that nobody wants to deal with. And he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? We could just park here the rest of the time we're here. To, you know, today today we have, we have people who profess to be Christians defending homosexuals. Sounds to me like they're, they're, they're taking people who do evil and trying to say that they're acceptable in the sight of the Lord. We have Christians today who uh, are promoting the transgender movement. Is that you? Are you part of that? I'm fairly sure people that would do that or be a part of these things probably wouldn't be listening to me. I'm fairly confident in that. Now, it could be, but maybe they're searching for truth. Maybe they're searching for some help. But you're not going to find justification here for your chosen lifestyle. Christianity is not, does not provide opportunities to, to, to talk down to homosexuals or people caught up in the transgender movement. That's not the point. Sin needs to be dealt with, and those two aspects of life, those two chosen lifestyles, chosen lifestyles, let me say it again, chosen lifestyles are sinful. Well, what about fornicators? Okay, so it's, it's easy to pick on homosexuals and people who are, who are confused about their gender. What about people who participate in fornication and adultery? Have you found a way to make it acceptable for you to be a fornicator? You know what the Bible says about fornication? It says to run, flee, get away. Do you live life as a whoremonger? All whoremongers shall have their place in the lake of fire. Okay, let's, let's say maybe you don't do those things. Maybe you don't participate in those things. Do you watch it on television? Do you watch it on YouTube? You watch it on the internet? Do you listen to it on your phone? Do you listen to it through your headphones? Through your daily life, are you helping to promote evil? And then when you get caught, instead of saying, yeah, I shouldn't have been doing that, you want to join the, you want to join the social justice warrior crowd and... and, and turn against biblical Christianity and act as though we just made all this up. You act as though we just decided we, we didn't like homosexuals or we didn't like fornicators or we didn't like people in the transgender movement or we don't like alcoholics. These are not, this is not a subjective personal taste mentality. God said these things are evil. And so if we're going to claim to be Christians, which, by the way, Christianity is defined by the Bible, not, not by the world's subjective application of Christendom, Christianity is defined biblically, and those who are going to claim to be Christians should be biblical. But instead, people want to dance on both sides of the fence and jump across whenever it feels convenient to them. And God said it's evil. 
He said it's wrong. It's not good. Uh, Christians are promoting toxic and deadly ideologies, such as socialism and communism. Have you bought into critical race theory as a Christian? Are you blacking out your Facebook page and, and your, 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 uh, your, your photos and things to show your support to Black Lives Matter? These are communist organizations. And your ridiculous, unfounded participation in societal guilt just means you've allowed them to convict you. You have succumbed to their preaching. You have bought into their doctrine but you won't let a preacher stand in the pulpit and open God's word and let that bring you under conviction. No, you'll fight against that. You'll call that man bigoted. You'll, call, you'll tell that man he's wrong. You'll fight against that man, but you'll join every wind of doctrine this world throws at you. Th these, are, th these, are Christ these are people who claim to be Christians, and they are trying to convince men that God is not the God of judgment, and this is a terrible mistake. He is a God of judgment. And he judges evil. And he's going to deal, he already deals harshly with evil, but he's going to continue to deal harshly with evil. Your willingness to participate in it, and your willingness to promote it, and your willingness to pay a monthly subscription for it, doesn't change any of that. that it, it doesn't change a thing in the world. All it means is you're a compromised <laughs> child of God. And and that's whether you're a child of God or not is debatable, but I have no way to tell. If you there's only one way to be saved, the only way to have your sins forgiven is to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if you've done that and become a child of God through that process, which is what God promised, John one twelve. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on His name. Okay, if that's you, then you're a rebellious child of God, and you need to fix it. Just because you've decided to live life in a rebellious manner against God doesn't mean you need to convince the rest of the world that you're justified in doing so. You're not. It's wrong. And God might deal with you in this life, and you might feel the reper repercussions of that in this life through his chastening, or you might have to stand before God and explain yourself. One of the two is coming. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the Lord tries to talk to Judah in the book of Malachi. And all they want to do is argue with him till finally the Lord wraps up the book and said, you know what? You got the law on Moses. <laughs> do that. I have nothing else to say to you. That would be a sad position to put ourselves in. You, you don't want to so reject and deny God and his word that he comes to the point that he says, I'm tired of it. I'm done with you. I don't want to talk to you anymore. When Elijah comes, you'll hear what I have to say to you next. Till then, I don't want to hear from you. You have the law of Moses, do it, keep it. So that, that's Judah's attitude in Malachi's day. Which, which one resembles your attitude towards the preaching of God's word? Do you find yourself meeting the pastor at the pulpit after church and straightening, straightening out what he had to say? telling him what you disagree with and what you didn't like and that you wish he didn't preach this or preach that or say this or say that? Or do you find yourself at the altar in, in repentance because you're broken over the preaching of God's word and, and its application to your life? Uh, we, we, have a, we have a rash of Christians in the world today who think it's their job to straighten out God and to and to inform preachers that what God really meant in his word. He didn't mean what, what he said. What he really meant was some other, some other idea that I agree with because I don't agree with what you preach today. So if that is your mentality, I hope you'll change it. I hope you'll break that. 
Remove that from your life because it's ungodly. You see the result in Haggai's day, they repented. That was some hard preaching. I, I doubt anybody's had such personal knowledge of your life that they have preached at you publicly in that way. So thank God for, for the very specific but general approach that he gives us through the preaching of his word and learn to be sensitive to that to respond to it and be obedient to God's word. If you have an argumentative attitude and your pastor dreads seeing you coming because of your attitude, that's not good. You're not helping yourself. You're not helping your church. You're not helping your family. You're not helping the name of the cause of Christ. Even if, you're, even if by chance you were right, which there's a good chance you're not. But just by chance, you who, re- who rarely ever reads your Bible and rarely ever studies and rarely ever spends time with God versus your pastor who presumably, if you have a good pastor, spends uh, hours upon hours studying God's word. Let- let's assume you got it right and your pastor got it wrong. It's not likely, but let's assume, let's assume that was the case. There are respectful ways for you to go and for you to go about dealing with that. Your pastor should be approachable immediately after the sermon is preached. So you can go and wag your finger in his face in front of other people is not the time or the place or the, or the, or the, or the means to accomplish that. Give him a call. Tell him you have something you'd like to talk to him about. Sit down with him and respectfully show him what you think you have found because he may end up enlightening you as to, as to something you missed somewhere. And if he doesn't, if you're right and he's a good man, then he'll say, you know, you're right. I I apologize. I'll, I'll get that. I'll straighten that out and we'll move on. But the idea that you're going to sit and listen to God's word preached, and then you're going to argue with God, or you're going to argue with the truth from God's word. That's not a good idea. That's not a good idea. And it's rampant. It's a, it's a massive problem across the world, across the West, across America. People, people think that God is there to be straightened out. God is there to, to uh, his, his word is subject to opinion, and it's not. Your private interpretation needs to be left at home. God didn't want to speak to Judah again <laughs> until John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he said, if, and if, if, if Elijah doesn't come and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, then I'm just going to curse every one of you. But praise the Lord, John the Baptist came. He did just that. Now, this short comparison notes the radical difference between the response of the people to the Lord's word in Haggai versus Malachi. It's a big difference. We want to resemble the people of Haggai's day in terms of their repentance to the preaching of God's word. We do not want to resemble the Judah and Malachi's day at any point in your life. Something could be found that is contrary to the word of God. That's, I don't think any of us is expecting any other, anyone else of us to display absolute perfection, but we are to display a humble attitude towards the word of God and a willingness to repent when someone is able to clearly show us some problem, some unbiblical problem in our life. Now, Judah was obedient in Haggai's day, but throughout their history, both Judah and Israel have shown themselves to be rebellious and and a stiff-necked people. In fact, the reason the book of Malachi exists is because their disobedience forced God to send them into captivity. That's Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The reason those books exist is because they just came back from captivity and were trying to, to regather themselves in the land and could barely get going. We can see this progression from Jeremiah's day all the way through to the book of Haggai. And, and, and even on, I mean, when the Lord himself shows up, they're arguing with God. The, the Son of God, the Messiah, is, is standing before them. You know, they, and they knew, and they knew that. There's plenty of evidence in the in the uh, the four gospels to display that they knew that. 
But there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John is baptizing in the, in the Jordan River, and God says, you're going to baptize a man, and the Holy Spirit is going to come upon him, and you're going to know that is the Messiah. He gave him you know, clear instruction as to how this was going to happen. And it happened that way. And, they, and they, they went and they fought against God. And they argued with God. So we'll look at a few passages in Jeremiah uh, that demonstrates this same disobedience that, again, that what we saw in Haggai is an anomaly. It's rare. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 20 through 25, Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband. So that's what God thinks about wives leaving their husbands. It's treacherous. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return ye, backsliding children." And I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. So this is, this is Israel's response. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth. Their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters, we lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even unto this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. They refuse to obey. This seemed to be a moment of repentance, but further reading would prove their insincerity. You know, God, God continued to plead with them, but uh, he also warned them that, that captivity was coming if you continued this. In the early chapters of Jeremiah, he gave them one last chance. If you will repent. And, and, you know, the reason they didn't repent and the reason a lot of you don't repent, the reason a lot of people don't repent is they think I can just say, okay, I repent. No, you're going to repent and then you're going to go make it right. And he told Judah, you're going to repent and then you're going to make it right. And they said, well, we'll repent, but we're not going to make it right. And God said, okay, either you do what I said or you're going into captivity. And they didn't believe him. They didn't listen to him. And so God sent them into captivity. But here, by their own admission, we didn't obey the voice of the Lord. And, and this seemed like a moment of repentance in Jeremiah chapter 5, but it wasn't. It was short-lived, and, and it was not sincere, and it didn't last long at all. It was a joke. Jeremiah 42, verses 18 through 22, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you. When ye shall enter into Egypt, and ye shall be in exec an execration, and an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, and ye shall see this place no more. The Lord has said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye into Egypt, no certainly that I have admonished you this day, for you dissembled in your hearts when you sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. And we will do it. And that we always say, Lord, if you just fix this, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> and we will do it. And now I have this day declared, declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or any thing for the which he has sent me unto you. Now, therefore, know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence in, in the place whither ye desire to go and to sojourn. God said, you, want, you don't want to listen to me? You want to do what you want to do? Okay. But wherever you go, you go wherever you want to go in disobedience to me, but wherever you go, you're going to die by the sword. You're going to die by pestilence. It's you're, you're, not, you're, you're going to be miserable, and death is going to be upon you. Now, I'm not telling you that God's going to do that to you. I am telling you a life of disobedience to God is a horrible life. 
The way of the transgressor is hard. Hard. Life is complicated, difficult, even harmful without God. That's where all this world's confusion comes from. Why, do, why does evil exist? Why do these terrible things happen? Because you won't listen to God. God is right. God is holy. God is truth. God is good. God is faithful. When we do what he says, we reproduce that in the world. When we violate what he says, we bring about the exact opposite in the world. Those are your only two directions. And so God said, you want to go where you want to go? Take off. But there will be consequences to your disobedience. Mm. Jeremiah 44, verses 20 through 23. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer. So all people in the Bible would be men and women. Um, no one gets left out. Saying, the incense that ye burn in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them. And came it not into his mind so that the Lord could no longer bear. Now you think about that. You can, you're gonna, you can take God to a point to where he can no longer bear. We're going to see the next passage we're going to look at. We've read it in this series of studies on the book of Haggai before. God said that Judah reached a point to where there was no remedy. Here he's saying, <laughs> you took me to the point that I could no longer bear it. I'm tired of it. I can't handle it anymore. I can't deal with it anymore. So I'm going to fix it. You don't want to push God to that point. God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You, you can reach a point with God to where he finally just says, okay, <laughs> you, you've gone far enough. Now, I don't know where that point is. I don't want to know where it is. I just want to do, Lord willing, the best I can daily to stay as far away from that as I possibly can. Our next lesson next week is going to be on, on that same passage in Judah said they feared the Lord. You better fear the Lord. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You do not want, to, you do not want God turning his anger and his wrath towards you. You don't want to be on the, be on the receiving end of his judgment. You, you can mock at that all you want. You can think it's funny all you want. But the day of judgment is coming. And you want to be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when that day comes. You do not want to be found wanting. Everybody thinks it's a joke. Uh, okay. It's your prerogative. Because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day, because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. So just disobey God. Don't do what he says. As, a, as an individual, as a family, as a nation, um, you can turn your back on God. You have that option. And it seems, uh, at least the world that I come from, it, it seems they have chosen to turn their back on God. They have chosen to turn away from God. If they even mention God, it's, it, it's some made-up God. It's some made-up Jesus that doesn't exist other than in their own minds. It's not the God of the Bible. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus said, many false Christs shall come, and uh, they certainly have. <laughs> that, that is, that is without a doubt, that is 100% true. So, Second Chronicles, so that's Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, there are numerous other instances we could have looked at. It, it's just riddled with the, this rebellious attitude towards God and His Word. The result of that is they went into captivity for 70 years. And God sums that up, again, we've read it a number of times, but in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 11 through 21, God gives just a, a beautifully concise description of what happened with Judah. 
Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign and, and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. You, you know, some of you might ask, why do you always talk about communism and socialism? It's an ideology of the heathen, and many of you have bought into it. God, God says the part of the problem here with Judah is they, they transgress very much after all the abominations of the heathen. So American Christians have bought into their ideologies. They watch their television shows. They listen to their music. They watch their, their nonstop uh, social media platforms and videos and, and audio that's available through those uh, podcasts. Uh, I mean, the, the, the number of ways that, that Christians in the West and more specifically Christians in America have transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. That, that is... That is so descriptive of Christianity today, it's scary. Now, this is talking about Judah. This is applicable to Judah. But it, again, it was written for our learning and admonition, and the principle is true. And the principle should scare you. But people just keep playing with God as though God doesn't mean what he says. As though he wouldn't destroy two of his own temples and send his own people into captivity. This is not a joke. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people till there was no remedy. That little phrase terrifies me. What does God think about his church right now? What does God think about his preachers right now? What does God think about his people right now? Because the evidence that they are, they are faithful to God's word is very slim. It's not looking good. The evidence that they've gone after every abomination of the heathen Mm, that, that, that seems to be a little more descriptive of, of what we're facing today. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and brake down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the godly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons, till the reign of the king of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as they lay desolate. She, keep, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So this is a terrible situation to be in. And it was completely unavoidable to anyone that was willing to obey God, to any nation that's willing to obey God, to any people that are willing to obey God. None of this had to happen. And God makes that clear. I sent them my prophets. I tried to turn them in a different direction. But see, and, and, and the problem is the same today. God's trying to turn all men. God commanded that all men everywhere repent. That's his desire. That's what he wants. He wants all men everywhere to repent. 
But that means listening to the preaching of a preacher who opens the word of God and then humbling yourself and admitting that what God said through that preacher is correct and what I think and the way I live is wrong. And, I, and most people just aren't willing to do that. They're not going to. So what about when they were in captivity? Daniel 9, verses 7 through 14. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. As at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. Daniel had a wonderful heart of just love and respect for God that, that was just unprecedented, unfounded elsewhere. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him and he hath confirmed his words. That's the scary part. God said, you don't obey me. I'm going to send you into captivity. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that, that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understandeth thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. Now, soon after Daniel 9, the Lord sent Judah back to Jerusalem. And this brings us right back to the book of Haggai. They get there and they begin rebuilding the temple. The people were reorganized. They were reorganized religiously, and they did so in accord with the law of Moses. But opposition soon appeared, and the people chose to obey man rather than God. Whether that man is you yourself and your own thoughts, or that man is the government, or that man is, is some other uh, you know, pressing factor that comes upon you or, or, or tries to force its ideas upon you, whatever the case may be, you got to decide if you're going to be obedient to God or you're going to be obedient to man and do what God says. Now, the Lord allowed the people space to change their minds. This was further facilitated by drought, poverty, and intensified toil with the most basic aspects of life. It seemed the people didn't mind but after the Lord had enough, he sent his prophet to correct the matter, and the people obeyed. They got back to work on God's house, and it pleased God. That, it's, it's that, it, honestly, I, I understand, as we look at the book of Haggai, it is, it is deeply personal, but it's very practical. You know, it's not deeply intellectual. It, you know, it's not intellectually stimulating, and it's not overly philosophical. God said, do A, B, and C, and I will be pleased. Judah went and did A, B, and C, and it pleased God. <laughs> wow. But what would our lives look like if we kept it that simple? Daily, if we just pleased God, if we just, if we just made an effort every day, so, okay, God wants me to do A, B, and C. I know that because I read it here in his word. I'm just going to do my best to do this, and God will be pleased. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That'd be preaching the gospel. Do you preach the gospel? So, you know, it, it's, it is, I'd like to say it's easy to please God, but I don't do enough to please God. So I guess I can't honestly say that. Otherwise, I'd, have to, I'd be required to really change some things and, and do more to be pleasing to God. And that is my desire. 
daily to try and do more to please God, to be more Christ-like, to be more faithful to what the Lord wants me to do. You know, I, 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 I have an unbelievably busy schedule here. I am constantly doing something to get the Word of God out to people, to help people, to, to study, to read, to prepare, to record, to uh, disciple, to preach the gospel. To, I mean, we just we try to stay as busy as we can here. And I still feel like it's never enough. And I want to, you know, if I could get to the place, I guess, where I felt like it was enough, then that might be a dangerous place to be. So we'll just keep trying to do more and keep trying to do more and keep trying to do more and do what we can to please God. Now, we hear much talk in our day about revival. It seems for most that any hope of revival, at least on a large scale, is lost. And this Hope will remain lost if you and I do not get out into this lost and dying world and confront it with God's word. The people will have, <clears throat> excuse me, the people will have to respond with obedience, but they never get that opportunity if we do not go out as God's messengers and preach God's message. We'll end this with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, become followers of the churches of God, which in Judea, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost." Don't be that person. Don't join that crowd. Receive the word of God as it is in truth, the word of God. It'll help you. It'll strengthen you. It'll build you up. It's a wonderful thing. It really is. Now, you might have to test the water. You might have to break down some of your previous mentality and, and get over some things. That it's, it's worth it. I promise you it's worth it. So... Uh, if I can encourage you to do that or help you in any way in doing that, you just let me know. I'll be happy to do so. Until then, thank you for listening, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast.